Okay, so uh, my name is Alex Stone Sweet. Uh, and on behalf of the Center for Comparative and Public Law, I want to welcome all of you to our new year and to present or to introduce Matthias Kuhn uh, to my left. Uh, Professor Kuhn is the Inga Rennert Professor of Law at New York University School of Law. Uh, he also holds a professorial appointment at the Humboldt University uh, in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, and I also want to welcome Matthias to HKU, where he'll be, he'll be participating in the Constitution and the Civil Code in Asia workshop that begins uh, on Friday. And Matthias is, uh, with no exaggeration, is the leading scholar in the world on that topic, the interface between uh, constitutions and the civil code. Uh, in fact, I hear, I've been told, that his paper on the total constitution, and who is afraid of the total constitution, and you should be, uh, has been widely read and discussed on mainland China. Of course, they're discussing themselves, but, but via Matthias, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. And for present purposes, Matthias, has also made uh, fundamental contributions to the construction, that's the right word, of a new field over the last 20 years, a field that we call a global constitutionalism. And this field rests on two important claims, simplifying. And the first is that international law and courts uh, have developed on their own, uh, whatever that means on their own, but have autonomously developed uh, constitutional characteristics for a variety of international legal situations and regimes. And the second is that modern constitutional practices, the constitutional practices in uh, important um, uh, uh, national situations, especially those that are uh, governed by rights-based constitutionalism uh, have, uh, or should condition, have conditioned uh, uh, the development of international law, broadly speaking. So uh, he is also the founder of a journal called, appropriately, Global Constitutionalism. He's one of the founding uh, editors uh, of that. And I would add that in this field, the idea of a global constitution and global constitutionalism itself is, um, for the most part, a scholarly, a scholarly uh, construction, uh, for the most part. Um, that said, uh, there's always been, within the field, um, an acknowledgement that uh, there are constraints placed on the evolution of global constitutionalism, and these are related to state power and interests that might be opposed to those uh, developments. One of the reasons we started, or Matthias started studying global constitutionalism, in my view, was because it was such a surprising outcome uh, that it was it was something that was unexpected and needed to be explained. Now that that said, of course, everyone knew and understood that there were that there were these uh, constraints. So I'm going to give the floor uh, to Matthias, and our format will just be that he will. Let's speak for 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll use the rest of the time for discussion. So, Matthias. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction, uh, Alec, and thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, the title of my, call, my talk is Global Constitutionalism, Great Power, Competition, and Prerogative Power. Maybe it's useful to begin uh, by saying that the idea of global constitutionalism uh, is an idea of trying to conceptualize the world of law within a unified framework, a unified framework of authority. The idea is that the history and tradition of constitutionalism rightly understood, this is an interpretive claim, uh, is one is, is about the project of free and equals, individuals who in their relationship conceive of themselves uh, as free and equals to uh, govern themselves, to govern themselves um, as free and equals in relationship with others. 
And if that's the project, to think about how authority and law can be structured on such, with such a normative presupposition, uh, that is what, um, on the one hand, very traditionally, of course, liberal democracy on a domestic level um, is widely recognized to be about or can be reconstructed uh, to be about. Um, and if so, my claim, this is not the topic of this talk, but is if, if all law needs to fulfill, you know, needs to be able to be reconstructed uh, as playing a role in fulfilling this particular purpose, then of course, there cannot be a deep distinction between public law and private law and the basic principles that govern the interpretation uh, of um, private law must be informed uh, by the foundational principles of the legal system as a whole. That's kind of the, that's the part that I will not be talking about here now. But similarly, um, the other big divide that we are familiar with from traditional jurisprudence between the national and the international. Conventionally, we think there are, well, there's state law, the law within the state, and then international law is kind of something quite different, quite a different animal. Um, it has its own problems. Um, uh, it's, it's not the law of a state. Some of the centralized features that we know from domestic legal systems are absent. And so that is typically, traditionally, historically, has been relegated to a secondary status. And, when it, uh, and even when it gained a more central status, gained greater importance, has often been studied as an independent phenomenon without relating it. Uh, to the domestic. And what a global constitutionalist framework for thinking about the world of law tries to do is to see how they actually should be thought of as being integrated uh, as legal whole, have a distinctive role to play. Um, so in that sense, uh, the claim is that international law too, international law as you and I or anybody who studies international law knows it, should be understood and should be, you should try to reconstruct it and progressively develop it, interpret it in line with certain basic principles ultimately derived from the constitutionalist tradition. That's kind of a core basic background claim. Now, one of the preconditions for such a claim to be even remotely plausible is that we can understand the international as a genuinely legally structured domain. Um, which has in some way or another solved what we might call the Hobbesian problem. So the Hobbesian problem uh, is the problem of a war of all against. Um, and now for those of you who might have an international relations background, by the way, uh, a cold war discipline, it's important historically to understand that, um, uh, you, uh, the first thing you learn is uh, that the international system is one where anarchy, anarchy prevails. There is no sovereign. Um, and uh, so it's a very different type of a structure best, best analyzed through the lens of politics uh, rather than uh, law. Now, if we look again, just historically to begin with, uh, when the language of constitutionalism was actually connected to it, the analysis of international law, it is not a coincidence that these were moments in which the possibility and reality of great power conflict seemed to be moving into the background, seemed to have been overcome as a problem. So uh, the first time that cons global constitutionalism became a way of thinking about international law was actually in the uh, interwar years and the, the 1940s in particular, um, of course, that was a time in which there was a major war uh, from 1940, 1939 to 1945, but it was also clear that there'd be something else established afterwards. So that there'd be a move away from the old international, from the West Peace of Westphalia, 1648 to 1918, end of World War I. That world, that old world of international law uh, would be transformed into something else. That was the, that was the idea, that was the the lens through which uh, certain reforms that took place in international law were interpreted. And the hope was that these new structures, these new reforms, would lead to a situation where certain types of major great power conflicts, not all conflicts, not all armed conflicts, uh, but certainly the, the, the collapse of the 
The phenomenon of world wars, the collapse of uh, order altogether, uh, would, could somehow be effectively addressed. And if we ask, so that was, that was in, the, in the interwar era and in the 1940s, and we are again, or were again in, an, in such an era after the end of the Cold War from the 1990s onwards. And so one question that is interesting to ask is, how in these different historical points, if what I say is correct, you can only, it, could, it only makes sense to talk about global constitutionalism in a context where a Hobbesian problem has effectively in some way or another been addressed. Then how was it that the Hobbesian problem was imagined to have been addressed at these different points in history? And why is it a problem again today? So I think in the 19, uh, in the, in, if we look at the first in 1940s, um, we, look, we see the Roosevelt administration under the leadership of the Roosevelt administration engaged in a huge institution building project on the international level. The moment that Roosevelt decides that the United States will go to war. In 1941 in January, he gives his famous speech to the US Congress, um, which basically is supposed to prepare the American people uh, that the economy will be moving towards a war economy and that the United States will probably go to war. And in that same speech, uh, he declared what the aim of that war would be. And that was to create a new legal order, a global, new global legal order, where, where the kind of things that had happened recently, World War I and World War II, would not, be, would not occur again. And the particular solution uh, he found was not a, a, a thin legalistic one. There were previous attempts like the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928 to basically ban war uh, as a legal rule. But as an American president, as, as an institutionalist thinker, you understand that just having primary rules is not going to be enough uh, to actually change things on the ground. That's empty legal formalism. That's not how the world works. So you have to build institutions. Um, and the concrete institutions, most of which, this is, I'm now talking about a legacy, most of which is forgotten because we interpret post-war history through the lens of the Cold War that soon thereafter happened. But if we look at the imagination, the legal imagination from 1941 to 1946, roughly, um, and we, if we look at the UN Charter as it actually was written during that time, there are parts which have fallen in complete desuetude, which have no relevance, have never been of any relevance but which reveal a certain imagination of, an, of the international legal order. And so the way the Hobbesian problem was supposed to have been solved was, was the following idea, was the following idea. First, there was a primary prohibition of the use of force. You may not use force even to enforce rights. You can't claim that just because someone else is violating a right, you're right. That means you can try to respond um, to that rights violation by, you, by coercive. You may not do that under international law. That's Article 2, Section 4 of the UN Charter, unless you're subject to an armed, ongoing armed attack. That's the right of self-defense. You have that. But otherwise, uh, only if there's a UN Security Council authorization. Now there's an international institution uh, that comes in that authorizes the use of force, can force uh, be legally used internationally. So you have, you have a, a, a primary prohibition of the use of force, but you have an institution which is supposed to address uh, problems of the use of force. And more than that, it was also envisioned that the UN Security Council would be complemented by a so-called military staff committee. That's actually an institution which is written into the UN Charter. It actually exists. It meets once a year. People have a, have a cup of coffee and then they go away again. It doesn't do anything. Uh, but that military staff committee consists of the UN General Secretary, who's not just a secretary, but also a general, along with the leading... Um, leading military representatives of the P5. And they're supposed to be kind of the military consultants to the UN Security Council, the kind of the administrative, the administrative side. And furthermore, the UN was supposed to have armed forces available at its core, made available by the major powers in advance through contract, through tre tre treaty uh, to the UN. That's what the UN Charter provides. That was the original idea. So you have basically, to solve the Hobbesian problem, you had a full-fledged federalization uh, of core security concerns uh, institutionalized in the UN Charter. There was one premise 
um, which plays a central role for, for this model to have worked. And that is that it's possible to maintain a consensus among the major powers that fought as allies in World War II. So the UN Security Council could only act if the P5, the permanent members of the UN Security Council, would all agree on something. And of course, very soon after the end of World War II, um, or really complicated and interesting reasons, very quickly, the world degenerated into a Cold War where the basic trust among allies, uh, if it ever existed, certainly didn't exist to an extent that was necessary to make such a system function. Um, and so that whole idea, the idea that security could actually be assured within a legal frame and an institutional practice uh, that kind of enforces that legal framework was effectively given up. Nobody during the Cold War described international law uh, as a constitutional system because it was understood that in the background, what kind of enables the status quo to function was basically a balance of power. And in this case, a balance of power, which was grounded in the threat of mutually assured destruction. That's not a constitutional order, but that's something else. Now, after 1990, that shifted again. And what is interesting is that after 1990, there was no resuscitation of the old ideas of the Roosevelt administration to make the UN work uh, the way it was already, uh, the way it was envisioned to work. So you might have thought we learned that the the veto doesn't work all that well. Let's abolish that. Let's also make the UN Security Council a little bit more representative and get some other actors involved. None of that. Um, uh, you also you might also uh, consider now now making available forces to the UN. Never considered the Russians proposed it. Believe it or not, in the 1990s, but the US made sure it never even reached the agenda. Um, and so there was no interest uh, in, in basically revitalizing uh, the UN Charter um, and with regard to its original ambition. And the reason for that was that to a large extent, it was thought to be superfluous, unnecessary. The new world post-1990 was a world which in many ways, also from the security perspective, and that's the only perspective that I want to focus on here, was supposed to um, was supposed to reflect uh, the idea of the end of history, which presumed that in a world where there was, uh, the, there was a liberal democratic hegemony, no universality, it was clear that there were states that were not liberal democracies. That's okay, we don't need universality. But what you need is a clear hegemonic uh, liberal democratic consensus. Um, uh, um, and then, uh, there would be no grounds for major conflicts. Now, that doesn't mean that wars don't happen or that conflicts, civil wars or, made, or boundary conflicts between various states might not happen. That's all possible. But the idea of a major conflagration, a great power conflict, seemed very absent, uh, simply because uh, after the end of the Cold War, there were, were no major powers left except for the United States. So it was a unipolar uh, moment. And that is a moment we can describe in one of two ways from if we were thinking about the Hobbesian problem. One way to think about it is to say, we have an order where effectively the one indispens indispensable nation, the United States, anchors it, uh, provides the security guarantees and uh, invests in, in the military infrastructure. Uh, to provide, uh, to basically protect that order. Uh, that's one model. That's so it's a unipolar moment where you have one hegemon uh, that effectively uh, doesn't provide security for everyone in every respect, but at least to such an extent that major conflicts become impossible and, and will be, there'll be intervention to make sure that doesn't happen. That's one way of looking at it. But the alternative perspective, and that was actually the um, politics, People in international relations focused on that perspective. Lawyers were happy to focus on a happier uh, account, according to which really you don't even need a hegemon anchoring an order um, because the preconditions for uh, potential for real conflict and co the kind of competition that gives rise to war and conflict 
would not exist between liberal democracy. The democratic peace thesis, um, uh, the empirical claims that liberal democracies tend not to go to war against one another is one of the very few empirical uh, rules uh, in international relations, which uh, is, is with some issues relating to definitions about what constitutes war and what constitutes liberal democracy, but it's as solid as one gets uh, as far as these rules go. So that's a story according to which we don't actually need a hegemon anchoring in order. The Hobbesian problem goes away. In many ways, the European Union presented an example uh, of an order that can adequately be described as a constitutional order where the issues of war and peace have been resolved. Nobody in France thinks they might be attacked by Germany the next day or the other way around. Uh, that's just unimaginable. Um, and not because there's a new sovereign, not because Germany is hegemonic. Actually, France is the only nuclear power um, in, in the European Union. So it's not about hegemony and power that anchors the order. Um, uh, it's, it's the idea that given the relevant structure of these states um, and the benefits they create through cooperative structures, um, through tre treaties, etc., they establish an order that can appropriately be described a constitutional order because it serves the realization of the basic ideas and ideals that also domestic orders are guided by. That doesn't mean you simply replicate uh, the structures on the European level. They may have different structures that are closer to international law in many ways. But nonetheless, the idea is that here we have an order where the Hobbesian problem has been solved and it's a proper constitutionalized one. And what is true for Europe can perhaps be also true for the world. That's kind of, that's the moment, that's the 1990s moment, um, which sees the language of global constitutionalism um, emerging as uh, a way to, of interpreting and progressively developing uh, international law as it then uh, evolved. Now, I want to claim uh, the central claim of my talk today uh, is that if we want to use a constitutional frame to, to, to analyze uh, international law globally, we can only use uh, global constitutionalism as a critical frame, which helps us to illuminate deep structural uh, problems of the existing international uh, legal order. Those structural problems of the international legal order uh, resemble in many ways the structures that Ernst Frenkel um, uh, described uh, in his analysis of the national socialist state. Now that seems a little bit far-fetched and dramatic, um, but it's a conceptual claim here. The claim is not the international order is like fascism, that's silly. Um, uh, but what, it, what Ernst Frenkel described uh, in analyzing the national socialist state is the dual feature of the order. And what he means by that is that there were certain domains which operated law-like, ordinary. There was nothing, you know, the totalitarian, the horrible national socialist regime was one which across a wide range of fields for a wide range of persons operated like normal, uh, like a normal system, like a normal legal system. But then there was this other domain, the domain of the prerogative, where the executive could basically just intervene uh, and do whatever it deemed fit, whatever those who were in power decided were, was in the interest uh, of, the, of the public or the apparatus to do. So that was the domain where law was simply, didn't play a role, it was not a constraint. And I think this kind of idea of a dual order and this distinction between these two domains as a feature of the legal order, this is important. This was a legal, kind of a legal sociological analysis that uh, Frankel provided. And similarly, I think we can provide an, as an analytical frame, we can use this analytical frame to describe and get a clear understanding of the structural deficiencies of the existing uh, international legal order. So here's the core way I understand prerogative power as core problem in, in the international legal order um, from a legal point of view. Prerogative power is the power of a state to speak very colloquially to get away with murder, 
to speak less colloquially, it's the power to violate the rules relating to the prohibition of the use of force, knowing, it's not contingent empirically, but sometimes you get, knowing that you, that there are no, no effective mechanisms through which, legal mechanisms through which you can held, be held accountable. So it's the structural features that ensure lack of accountability. Not, you still violate, so it's not that the primary rules don't apply to you, so to the relevant great powers, they apply, but there are structural features of the international order for certain players, for certain actors, which ensure that they can't be held accountable. And they know it, it's part of the calculus when they interact uh, with others. So what are these features? So the core features that account for prerogative power from a legal point of view that enable it, enable such power to be exercised um, are uh, four. And when you have these four features, uh, then, uh, so these are individually necessary and collectively sufficient conditions for describing an entity uh, as a great power uh, which can exercise prerogative power. That's kind of a pretty formal um, definition. So these four features are, first, there is no, no court of general jurisdiction uh, to which uh, someone can go. So another state that claims to be injured can go to have their claim vindicated and assessed by an impartial and independent tribunal. Secondly, there's also, these two are closely connected. You might think it's one category because it's still about judicial accountability. There's also no criminal court. Uh, in which the individuals who are responsible for um, commanding acts of aggression uh, can be held um, accountable. Um, third, it must be a power which cannot be subjected uh, to authoritative sanctions uh, in, by the UN Security Council. Uh, and that can only happen, of course, if you're a permanent member. Otherwise, you not being held accountable, there is a contingent question. Um, so uh, it can only, you have to be a P5 uh, state. And finally, uh, you have to have nuclear weapons. Now that you may say is not really uh, uh, a legal uh, feature, um, uh, but it becomes, uh, or there's a legal angle to it uh, in there being a legal regime, um, which basically discredits and delegitimizes nuclear weapons. Uh, so if um, Germany wanted to decide that it could no longer rely on the nuclear umbrella uh, provided by the United States under a Trump regime, if he were to win the elections next year, uh, and said under the circumstances, depending on the French, is also not something you really want to do. So you build up your own nuclear arsenal. Well, that would be in violation of the non-proliferation treaty. That's an option that would be frowned upon, not only politically, but as legally, uh, as presents legal questions, legal issues. If Iran wants to have nuclear weapons, we know, you know it's, uh, there are all kinds of legal issues uh, they face as well as political issues. So uh, with other words, there's a legal regime in place uh, which generally prohibits and delegitimizes uh, acquiring nuclear weapons, but it also legitimizes five nuclear powers uh, as rightful, um, as rightfully um, uh, having nuclear weapons. It legitimizes them. It says, you know, as long as it's those five, that's okay. There is a duty of these powers to engage in good faith negotiations eventually to disarm, etc. But to begin with, um, there simply is a right to have these weapons uh, if you're a P5 member. And so, these features, I claim, work together to ensure unaccountability. And let me kind of use a number of examples to see how prerogative power functions in the real world. So I've just provided a relatively formal legal analysis. Uh, by the way, if you ask which states uh, actually meet all relevant criteria, there are only three. There are only three. And those are not surprising, the United States, China, and Russia. So, uh, it's not surprising that when we when we have the debate and the conflict today between um, those who 
describe the, st the status quo as a uni unipolar order, but want a more multipolar order, that these poles are defined by great powers whose conflict is about who gets to exercise prerogative power to what extent, with what limits. That's really what the conflict can be redescribed as. So how does it work in practice? So here's three short examples. First example, the United States after September 11. Um, and it doesn't matter, I don't want to go into the details of all the various actions that were taken from Afghanistan uh, to Iraq, to Libya, to Syria, to the uh, drone actions in 12 other countries, uh, to the torture programs, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is no question that at least there are, there are some things that may be contested uh, with regard to the legality, not everything um, uh, was uh, illegal, but many things were. Uh, and here's the important point. At no point was there any expectation by anyone that the United States would be held accountable or that anybody who ordered these programs would be held accountable before an international court or tribunal or would face serious international sanctions. Uh, it was clear that that wouldn't happen. Um, uh, there could be condemnation. So the fact that you have a great power acting illegally doesn't mean that everybody immediately accepts it. There can be discussions in the UN Security Council, even condemnations, a rhetorical. Of course, there will not be a UN Security Council resolution that will effectively order sanctions because there won't be, there'll be a veto placed. Uh, the General Assembly doesn't have the authority to impose um, uh, uh, sanctions bindingly. Um, uh, so in that type of context, uh, there can be political responses. And it's even possible for states to make individual decisions uh, because international law allows them to, to take certain measures, sanctions um, um, against great power for acting illegally. But that because it's not coordinated, because there is no authoritative binding decision by any international body that says for the international community, uh, here is a violation of international law, you are now asked to cooperate to make sure that it gets rolled back. That's what you'd need. If you don't have that, then any responses, countermeasures that states have the authority to take would be ad hoc and would only happen wherever it seems convenient for a state to do that. And of course, great powers have another uh, empirical contingent feature. They tend to be involved in the global economy in all kinds of ways. And the costs of taking countermeasures against great powers is often such that an individual states decide to let to just not respond uh, to uh, illegal acts um, by that power. So that's basically, and then so internet, so the United States acts, its actions amount to it, this is a uniform assessment, uh, even if you just look at this politically, to disaster, a humanitarian disaster, as well as a political disaster, as well as being illegal. And notwithstanding all of that, there are no consequences. There are no consequences. Nobody's have been held accountable um, for any of the, of, of the actions uh, taken. So that's the United States. Now, what about, let's go to Russia. And where, whether we want to focus and start the story in 2014 uh, with Crimea and the occupation de facto of parts of Eastern Ukraine, or we, whether we want to run it in 2021 with a special military operation. The point is here, it looks as if there is a real response, right? I mean, the West mobilizes um, uh, in a way that it did not against the, uh, uh, or, um, uniformly um, uh, against the United States. Uh, but it's still, not, it's still uh, but again, we don't have a formal, there's no court or tribunal uh, that can address the most the direct issues of the legality uh, of the armed intervention. There are courts and tribunals involved doing all kinds of things. Um, but the jurisdiction of these courts and tribunals is never to address directly the core issue, um, where the, which is the legality of uh, the use of force and the question whether a crime of aggression is committed. For that, there is no jurisdiction of any court. And of course, there's no UN, UN Security Council resolution and of course, um, uh, uh, there are just uh, basically coalitions of states uh, organizing countermeasures 
Um, and it is striking that the states that are currently participating in this coalition and imposing sanctions on Russia are exclusively states uh, under the nuclear protective umbrella of the United States. Uh, so any other states uh, are not involved in effectively sanctioning Russia. Now note, what is interesting is that there's a wider consensus that Russia is acting illegally. Um, uh, so there's, there's as close as it gets in the real world, the consensus that what Russia is doing is illegal. But countries such as Brazil or South Africa and Mexico, many others, um, they uh, are unwilling uh, to take measures against Russia because they are saying, look, now you're making this big fuss about these illegal actions and you want us to sacrifice because we have trade relations with Russia. There are certain benefits that we have from them and you want us to sacrifice for the greater good. But you know what? When things were, when you were the illegal actor, you know, nobody cared. Uh, and so this is hip hip hypocritical and therefore we won't be, you know, let, you're not going to be draft us into service, which ultimately is in the particular interest uh, of your respective states, uh, but not, uh, you know, but we don't respect you really as an, an actor um, upholding an order. Um, uh, but you know, this is a you're just you're just following through on your own uh, relevant interests. So there's you see the corruptive effect um, of prerogative power in action. And third, of course, the example um, uh, with regard to China, we might look at the Ch uh, South China Sea um, and the ter territorial claims that are made in the forms of the nine dash line, um, uh, as well as the, you know, those are just claims being made, but there are actual islets, islets and shoals, et cetera, that are being, um, that are being uh, land that is being, regained um, and uh, military infrastructure built uh, and military assets being placed on them, even though there are other countries that make claims to them from Vietnam to the Philippines, et cetera. So uh, that's another situation where um, uh, the least dramatic of the of these three, clearly, uh, but nonetheless, where you have where you have this action going on, it's understood that the success or failure of any of these claims will exclusively depend on balance of power considerations and on nothing else. Um, uh, so that's the situation that we currently have. Uh, and that's a situation that describes a world in which prerogative power um, operates, uh, structuring great power competition. Um, uh, and the dramatic thing in the background uh, and the historically unique feature, which some think promises stability and others think uh, opens the door to catastrophe, is the fact that we have that these are powers, of course, that have nuclear weapons. Um, and what that means is that a full conflict between them uh, is widely believed to be something that nobody could possibly have an interest in. And there are some who take comfort in this and say, this is a reason to believe that it won't happen. It's actually a pretty stable order. Now, I think there are all kinds of reasons why I think that's completely misguided, but I'm not going to go into the analysis uh, of that, um, uh, except to point to the fact uh, uh, that um, outside of the great drama of major nuclear conflict, um, if we look at the situation with regard to Russia and Ukraine, uh, we see how new, the existence of nuclear weapons structures the response to illegal acts. So even the West that does mobilize and is willing to sacrifice, what are they doing? They're imposing economic sanctions. They are delivering weapons to Ukraine. But what they're not doing is they're not fighting directly. Would they legally be entitled to fight directly on the side of Ukraine? Of course. If Ukraine asked them, they could engage in collective self-defense. And if Russia was not a nuclear power, that's exactly what would have happened. NATO would have long been involved and ended the war quite quickly. Russia would not have started it uh, if it had, did not have nuclear weapons. So with other words, uh, the existence of nuclear weapons kind of is not only, a, as some would hope, a guarantor of limiting conflict, it actually enables conflict. You, can, you actually can do things which you know that otherwise you would not get away with. 
because you can always threaten. And the, and the problem for the West is, even if you could defeat Russia, do you really want to defeat Russia fully? W wouldn't that mean that Russia would then raise the stakes and maybe uh, use nuclear weapons? And so this is basically the core point, and this is how I'm going to end uh, my uh, presentation. Um, prerogative power of the kind that we currently have um, uh, undermines um, the progressive development of an international law framed and as a global constitutionalist project. However, um, a global constitutionalist framework is still useful to critically reflect on exactly the structural features that would need to change uh, for that situation to be changed. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask a quick question, I'll allow you to keep presenting your, your, your paper or your ideas, and then we'll open it up to the floor. And uh, as most of you know, I'm a political scientist and my first field is international relations theory. And uh, this talk sounds like uh, the main, mainstream international relations discourse of the last almost 100 years now, since E.H. Carr and Morgenthau all wrote to Mearsheimer. It actually sounds like Mearsheimer today, uh, who famously predicted that once the nuclear umbrella was removed from Europe, we would have war again. And Germany and Germany and every other country would arm themselves with nuclear weapons as soon as possible. There's, a, I, I understand that, and that, that's really the basis of my question. The idea in most mainstream international relations theory, going back almost 100 years, is that law, ideas, and normativity itself can never matter except for at the margins. That ultimately the, ultimately, the most important forces are gonna be the balance of power and interest of particularly the, the, the large powers. There might be constitutional that will develop, but it's gonna be within uh, regional arrangements that are already under a nuclear weapon uh, umbrella, such as the, under NATO, or have already been spurred uh, by European integration, had been spurred on by the Marshall Fund and so on. It's already within hegemonic uh, the hegemonic stability of the region had already been given by the United States. Anyway, if we fast forward to your time in the 1990s, famously uh, Krasner argued that all of all of international law was what he called organized hypocrisy. Organized hypocrisy that we had lots of human rights and we had lots of law, but the law wasn't didn't matter. It certainly wasn't worth the the paper was written on. So my question is really. Uh, regurgitates the response to uh, this, to Mearsheimer and to Krasner, and this idea that all of law, all of ideas, all of the normative foundations that we think of uh, when we talk about something like global constitutionalism are uh, irrelevant. And so, and that's because meanwhile, in the period of time that you're talking about from 1941 or so to today, uh, uh, regional and international arrangements continuously inject more and more normativity into the system, more and more law covering more and more areas. That is, spaces that had been empty are now rapidly being filled. We have an international criminal court to take on some of these major questions. We have uh, the European, we have constitutional projects within the European Union and within the European Convention on Human Rights. We have constitutional projects in a, in, in other domains, including in the private law, if you know anything about the New York Convention and the International Chamber of Commerce, and when you look at arbitration and so on. So everywhere we look, we encounter law. Everywhere we look, we see uh, normative engagements to try to counter some of these uh, tendencies uh, that you've talked about. And so my question is, is really, how do we think about, uh, about this normativity, this almost continuous uh, progression of, the building of these normative structures. Are they entirely relevant? Is it all just organized a normativity or do they only matter at the margins? On the other hand, are the margins getting smaller and smaller for states? So one question is, uh, do things all stay the same as we move uh, over the last 70, 80 years uh, or uh, have, has the quality of international affairs uh, changed in any way uh, from the point of view of an international lawyer? Okay, uh, raise your hand and I'll put you on a list. Please, um, wait, while you respond, I'll take names. Well, I, to begin with, um, uh, my, and this is 
I hope, I, I, hope, I hope you don't feel insulted by that, Alec, but I have, um, in terms of the main paradigms for explaining the behavior uh, of states, I'm not particularly impressed by the record of international relations theory, well, not with regard to any of the general theories that operate. They're not just the realist theories. Realist theories, of course, which are about as utopian as any of the theories that I've ever encountered with regard to the, uh, their description uh, of uh, state behavior. So, um, uh, um, so I, you know, my, my starting point uh, is if you had to frame it in international relations, from a written international relations perspective, is a constructivist. Um, so states are interested in what they're interested in. And that varies depending their domestic structure and cultural features and blah, blah. Um, and there are certain structural features of the international system which provide a certain stability for certain interests. Fair enough, that's the realist point that comes in. Um, uh, but none of that, none of that precludes the, in principle the development of a strong normatively structured global space. So anyone who claims that that's not possible, somehow human beings aren't organized like that, there are structural features of a sovereign world which is incompatible with such order, I think all of that is bad, is not substantiated. So that's the starting one. Um, so what I've thought, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do is to do something much more fine grain. So, um, uh, and so, so um, I come as, as a constitutional theorist, uh, my great nemesis uh, as a constitutionalist is not realist international relations theory, it's Carl Schmitt as a constitutional theorist. Um, uh, and I always thought Carl Schmitt was brilliant uh, in describing certain moments and certain situations. The conceptual framework he uses uh, is one that it kind of really gets to grips with certain types of situations and certain things that are actually happening in the real world. And so there's a power to it. But what I was always interested in is to ask, what are the conditions under which a Schmittian description of the world is actually accurate? And what are the conditions under which it is not? So I think it's contingent. Um, so what, what Schmidt claims is the inherent feature of the political uh, is not. It's just a, it's the contingent feature of, of particular kind of arrangements that could in principle be changed. That's the counterclaim. And so you see how that would also be the response to, um, to realists or other types of international relations. Yes, I spent my entire career fighting against the realists. So hey, let's all thank uh, Matthias for great talk. So. <laughs>